आई वी एम अर्थ एज फार एज वी नो इट्स दी ओनली होम टू लाइफ इन द यूनिवर्स वाई वॉट इज इट दट मेक्स आवर प्लैनेट सो स्पेशल The answers are hidden deep in the Earth's past. To find them, we must travel back in time to see the first humans walk the Earth, to ride continents on a collision course, face killer dinosaurs, dive into oceans full of bizarre life forms. Feel the bitter chill of global ice ages, and experience the fury of cosmic missile attacks. We must travel back in time until we reach the birth of the Earth itself. Welcome to States of Anarchy. I'm your host Hamsini Hariharan and every week on the show we discuss issues about global affairs and foreign policy. I hope you recognize the voice that played at the beginning of the show. That's David Attenborough, who's brought the spotlight onto wildlife conservation unlike possibly anybody else in the world. Wildlife conservation is often a common problem. Some conservationists harbor high and possibly unrealistic hopes about what international wildlife law can achieve. Others are extremely skeptical, viewing wildlife treaties as paper tigers and their COPs as a waste of resources. But what does it mean to conserve wildlife? Considering the pace of climate change, what can be done to preserve the world that we have left? I'm excited by our guest today, not only because she's one of my closest friends, but also because she has such a rich background. Gunjan Menon is a conservation filmmaker and writer. In 2017, she trekked 12,000 feet for her first independent short film, The Firefox Guardian. The film won multiple accolades with over 30 international awards and nominations across 13 countries, including a student BAFTA nomination. Soon after, she played multiple roles for the eight-part conservation series On the Brink, which aired on Animal Planet and Discovery Channel. She was a presenter and camera woman on BBC's Blue Planet Live Digital Stories. She co-directed and edited an educational film called Living with the King for the Gaya people and Agambe Rainforest Research Station, which was translated into local Indian languages. She is the author of a book by the Habitats Trust Grant, which highlights the work of grassroots conservationists across India. In 2019 she launched a campaign called Why We Love Bats to try and change their usually vilified perception in India. She was invited as a keynote speaker to the Green Hub Festival in Assam and as a panelist to Durban South Africa to share her stories. But before we get to that, let's take a short break to hear from IVM Podcasts. Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast at Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I'd also like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, Intel Storytel and Camly. Check them out, they're a really good bunch of brands. This week in the spirit of Christmas, instead of giving you the long drawn out promo that I normally do, all I'm going to do is ask you to give me a Christmas gift. Go to ivmpodcast.com/survey, fill out our survey and send it out to us. We'd really appreciate it. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Hi Gunjan, welcome to the show. I'm so happy you can be here. I think of all my guests, you're going to be like the most eclectic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Okay, so you're a wildlife filmmaker. How did it start? How did you start doing this? So I like calling myself a conservation filmmaker because okay. over ninety percent of work that I've done is for conservation. It started. after college but i think the thought was always there it was way back when i was 3 years old i knew that i wanted to work in wildlife mm. because i somehow was more excited after seeing a bird of paradise in a book that my grandfather gifted me than any of the fairy tales that i had so i think i always knew i wanted to be associated with wildlife in some way Yeah. No, that's interesting. Well, for listeners they should know that we went to college together at the Symbiosis <laughs> Center for Media and Communication in Pune. And I know that that was when you made your first film as well, yeah. right? And it won awards. Yeah. So what was the film about? That film was um, just uh, that was just about the biodiversity of Satpura. It was made on the theme of forest water confluence and 
it was a three day competition where we had to just document the biodiversity and sort of turn it around into a story so that was my first time in the wild shooting in the wild and talking to people getting a piecing a story together so that's when i realized that i truly want to do this for life mm-hmm. so you passed out of college and you knew how to do filmmaking but how did you piece that together with wildlife and conservation so that's very interesting because i always knew that i wanted to do wildlife filmmaking but there was no course in india that was particularly for wildlife filmmaking i got into symbiosis thinking mm-hmm. that okay fine let me just learn the filmmaking part of it and then i'll study the science part of it myself and sort of combine the two and mm-hmm. i got into it i told them that this is what i wanted they said that 80% of our course will be a waste on you then i said that's okay I, i'll do with the 20% <laughs> and then uh, when i got out of college i was researching for post grad institutes and i found this course in which was a masters in wildlife filmmaking in bristol okay. and bristol is like the hub of wildlife filmmaking 40% of all of natural history films are made in bristol oh, around the world around the world oh wow yeah so um this course was in partnership uh, with bbc natural history unit and we had professors coming in and it was a highly specialized course for training wildlife filmmakers who are good storytellers like mm-hmm. the focus of the course was on good storytelling so I passed out of there and that was something that sort of changed my life because i made my dream film there okay tell me more about your dream film <laughs> so my dream film the fire fox guardian is like my baby and i put my heart and soul into it the film is about red pandas and the bond that they share with the first female forest guardian in nepal and that sounds lovely <laughs> thank you and it's just a very personal film i spent two weeks in nepal talking to this woman who was inspiring in so many ways and she'd never been on camera before so just getting the story out of her was a beautiful process and i sort of mixed genres there because i want to bring conservation films to the masses mm-hmm. and i realized that there was a gap in the market for such films because most of my friends didn't even know what a red panda was when i was telling them what that i wanted to make a film about red pandas one of them even said oh i didn't know pandas came in red and he was probably sort of imagining a giant panda so was i by the way the first red. time you told me about that like i didn't know pandas came in red yeah so i realized that okay people surely need to know and people my age so i need to make documentaries in a way that is more accessible to people in my generation so that's why i sort of changed the genres a bit and that's what i try doing now to like create awareness within our generation first because i think we have the power to change the world <laughs> that's amazing okay as someone who doesn't really get this what's the difference between like wildlife filmmaking conservation filmmaking and how is it different from your general filmmaking i don't know technically uh, is it shooting animals that different or i i would tell me more about that <laughs> well animals don't follow a script so there's the biggest difference okay of course <laughs> <laughs> so you can't go with a plan i mean what we go into the field with is what we call a shopping list so we have a sh- list of all the behavior that we want to capture based on the story we want to tell and what i do is i tell people stories as well so people at the grassroots working to help the animals survive so that's the main difference between wildlife films and what i do conservation films and pure wildlife films they call blue chip films that just um, like high budget animal behavior films Uh, like planet earth like planet earth, earth exactly okay. i grew up watching planet earth they inspired me to become a wildlife filmmaker but something was missing in those films you didn't know that that cute polar bear was in danger they were like ice caps smelting and you thought everything was happy around the world i grew up in a bubble and only now i've realized that okay the world is not as it seems in those movies so yeah the forests and like these landscapes are just very far from human imagination in that sense you think exactly. that oh this is happening in the forests of the amazon or the himalayas but you don't realize that there are people living there as exactly. well right people living there and there are so many problems there like amazon right now 
is struggling with displacement and deforestation at a large scale even in india that's happening but you don't see that in movies and you think oh everything you're sitting in a air conditioned room and thinking that oh everything's fine around the world because you see it like that in those movies so that's what i wanted to change through my movies i wanted to tell the truth in a way mm. so i know that the firefox garden was really well received mm. um what did you think of uh, how the film fared in film festivals around the world and things like that so it's gone around in a lot of film festivals screened at around 30 film festivals in around 12 countries around the world wow. and even got a bafta nomination it got a bafta nomination <laughs> i did not know that oh it, it did it did and that was really helpful because it sort of uh, reached a larger audience and i had a very sweet email i received after one of the screenings from a father of a 6 year old and the email had a photo attachment of this girl emmy holding a photo of menuka who's the lead in my film and she said that she wanted to become a conservationist after growing up and she wanted to be like menuka and she'd seen the film multiple times and she saw her as a role model and that is way more special to me than any of the laurels that i've received that i was able to influence someone the way planet earth or other films influenced me now that's very heartwarming and i think it's important the work that you're doing uh, moving on to conservation films in general there is a lot of content in the media space like you also work mm-hmm. freelance for commercial stuff you know how it is do you think that people care for for causes anymore because there's so much information that's being thrown mm-hmm. at you on the media space yeah. right now all around the world do you think that films like conservation films could do well considering how much you have it's going on on the media scape i think films are very powerful and we sort of underestimate the power at times so films are really powerful and i realized that when i saw how a film called shows of silence was able to make policy level changes in india this was a film by mike pande he is an indian a renowned indian filmmaker and he's won the green oscar mm. thrice i think so the hunting of whale sharks was banned in india and that is owed to this film and it was incredible till then i didn't realize i knew that films were powerful but i didn't mm. realize that we could actually affect laws and create change at policy level and even in britain right now you were talking about do people really care yeah. so there's something that's going on called the blue planet wave okay or the attenborough effect so what has happened after blue planet came out mm. was people realized how badly single use plastics were affecting the wildlife in the oceans and this led to a ban in single use plastics in the UK people are more conscious now they don't use straws they don't use disposable plastic anymore the kind of response that these films get is phenomenal i think yeah that's the david attenborough wave that they call it yeah i i think that's important because you know sometimes awareness doesn't really change people's behaviors you know that like spitting is not bad <laughs> on the street but you're going to do it anyway yeah. right and if conservation films are that powerful that they can mm-hmm. actually drive you to change things that you believe even on a personal level right. then that's something that's really really powerful yeah and we should exploit that power as filmmakers i think everyone's not doing that right now mm-hmm. we need to realize how much power we have to influence people and actually be using it everywhere because now we need it more than ever okay this is going to be a cliched question but <laughs> why do we need it more than ever i mean I know that climate change is real. I'm not a climate change denier. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm qualifying this, right? Okay, but tell me what the state of conservation is these days. You hear a lot of dire things on the media and then you have a lot of people who are climate change deniers who go, "Oh, all of this is hyperbole. The world is not that bad. Relax, chill out, drink some coffee." But what is the state of conservation today across the world? it's really bad and definitely not where we can chill out because we're actually in an ecological crisis right now and we should no longer be debating whether climate change is real or not mm-hmm. it is 
a climate emergency right now. We are going through something that's called the sixth mass extinction, okay. which is the only extinction that's been caused by human interference. Like if you look at the extinction of dinosaurs of the face of Earth, it's always been due to some natural phenomena. But this is the first time that large number of species are going extinct because of human interference, and that is something we should be really concerned about. But we're not ever going to be able to reverse it. Are we doing at least better than we did? a couple of decades ago we're not and unless we change the way we function right now it's only going to result in our own extinction as well so we also say that we are heading towards extinction and that actually is the extinction of the human race so i don't want to scare anyone here right now but this is if you look up about this this is a real problem and if we don't change the way we act now um we won't survive because people keep saying that Oh, nature needs us. Mother Earth needs us. But the reality is that we need nature. Nature will bounce back. Mm. It's going to be fine without humans, mm. but we need nature to survive. Yeah, and I think perhaps it's easier being in a developed country where you aren't seeing the effects of climate change that much. But just in India, right? If you look at the seasons, you exactly. look at the monsoons. Um, it, it is getting worse. When recently someone was asking my parents, "Are you not buying a house in Chennai?" And my father was like, "Will there be a coastline in Chennai forty years from now? Is this an investment that I want to make?" And then I was like, "Papa, don't be dramatic, you know." But but he's right. Yeah, it's a fair question. You don't know, right? And it's closer than ever in that sense. These are not effects that you're going to see ten years from now. These are effects you're going to see this year, next year, the year yeah. after that, right? Yeah, the water crisis in Chennai, the floods in Assam, floods all like all over actually, and the drought in Delhi, air pollution in Delhi. Like I, I've grown up in Delhi, and it's never been this bad. Mm -hmm. Fifty thousand children under the age of five die every year in India due to air pollution, but we're not doing enough about it. And all this is man-made, but the governments aren't acting enough. And, like I said, it is an emergency, but we're just not treating it as one. Yeah, it's not in our mind space. It's not important yeah. enough. It doesn't affect our livelihoods because we sit in AC rooms talking exactly. about this, right? But what is the state of conservation efforts across the globe? I know that because you work with this primarily, you're often on site when these things happen. But how are conservation efforts going? So I was in South Africa in July for a nature conference, and. They took us to a game reserve and I saw something that has been one of the hardest things I've ever seen, but it was for conservation. So in a game reserve called Somkanda Game Reserve, they were dehorning rhinos and we got to witness how they tranquilized a rhino and then took a huge chainsaw and cut off two of its horn like we saw it being done on a black rhino and a white rhino and problem is that rhinos face a threat of poaching and it's been a really bad situation and the threat increased way more after UN recognized traditional Chinese medicines and rhinos are being heavily poached for their horns so much so that the northern white rhino has been functionally extinct now with the last male dying recently so the crisis is real, but what this game reserve is doing, they're cutting off horns so that the poachers don't have a reason anymore to kill rhinos. It is like a necessary evil, extremely hard to watch because there's this magnificent creature lying in front of you, helpless, and you're cutting off, you're deforming an animal that has, it's a prehistoric animal, but you're deforming it because of threads that we have only created for the animal so yeah that was really hard to watch no that sounds horrible as well i mean yeah we're, we're literally deforming this animal and this is the sort of the only policy choice you have i mean how else do you protect it you can step up like park rangers and stuff i'm guessing yes they're doing that in india and like to add to what south africa is doing right now they said that that's the only way right now that the rhinos are alive in that country which just makes us question what we've come to. But in India, we because this kind of an operation takes a lot of uh, money, mm. because obviously you need funds, you need specifically skilled vets, you need funds for helicopters to do the tranquilization. In India, I think we can't afford that mm. right now. And a lot of countries, even in Africa, are using rangers or like specifically mm. trained 
officers to combat poaching. In India, we have something called the Special Rhino Protection Force, which is uh, deployed in Kaziranga and neighboring states right now. And they're trained specially to handle poaching. Yeah, and with their expertise, they're able to tackle all the challenges that come with poaching effectively. And these are armed guards and they're doing a really good job. But the rhinos in India face a different problem that is floods in Kaziranga, annual floods in Assam and habitat loss more than poaching. But that's something else to discuss. Yeah, I mean, I guess threats vary by region. But I was also thinking, how do you sort of tackle a problem like this, right? With any I'm going to call it an illegal substance. I know that these are living <laughs> creatures. Uh, but with like any illegal substance, either you crack down on the demand side or you crack down on the supply side. What happens with like a lot of illegal things is when you ban them, they automatically go underground. Yeah. And w- when you legalize them, you can say, oh, at least like the government is making tax money out of this. But with things like poaching and stuff, I'm really caught ethically about how to think of a policy response for this. I mean, you can create awareness in... You can try to force people to change the way they think about using some of these um, animal products or, you know, wanting to use some of these animals in their daily lives. Um, or the alternative is you go to the animals and say, OK, we will protect these better. And mm-hmm. But that's just it's... Uh, it, Short term. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think you have to work at two levels here. Firstly, you'll have to work with the locals who get dragged into poaching because obviously nobody wants to be a poacher. They're doing this to support their families. So conservation always has to work hand in hand with the people. So once you start getting the people involved in in an alternate source of income that is as lucrative as poaching. But also, it's important to note that they never end up making as much money as the kingpins are making. They get only a share of it. And I don't want to discuss the exact costs of it, but for security reasons, but you know, horns and ivory and skins, they fetch a lot of money. We're talking about thousands of dollars. And but these people only get like a share of it, which like is like 100, 200. Hardly anything, even less than that. And the people actually making the money are the kingpins at the top of the pyramid. And these people are most at risk, right? They don't have livelihoods. Exactly. Um, if they are caught, they will be the ones who are penalized for doing yeah. this. And they get the least paid. They get the least paid. So you have to work and try to get them to understand that. I mean, I'm sure they know this is illegal and this Mm. is wrong, but they don't have an option. So I think if we work hand in hand with them and get them an alternate source of income, then it can be solved at that stage there. And then the next thing is to crack down the entire trade, which is like obviously a much bigger operation. But till you tackle the demand then then you can you have to just stop the demand altogether because rhino horn what is rhino horn it's the same material as your fingernails so somebody one day decided that that thing is going to be valuable to me they decided mm-hmm. okay so rhino horn is apparently um, an aphrodisiac and if you oh, yeah okay. and how they use it is they um, grind it and make a powder out of it mix it in water and drink it and it's supposed to I don't know, help with all of this. Yeah, that's the thing, right? We assign all these symbols to random objects and make them important. And um, this affects everything. And things like poaching don't and extinction don't affect animals. They affect the entire food chain. And I don't think people realize that. Mm. Um, Particularly when you have money and you're insulated from real problems, I guess. Yeah, and even traditions. For example, red panda fur is used as a hat in China. In some tribes where um, the groom wears a hat and it's supposed to bring good luck. Mm. And just a simple thing is how can a dead animal bring you good luck is something that I think that barrier is something we need to break. And if we change the mindsets at that level as well, then both the sides will be balanced. We're working with the locals and we're working where the demand is. So that's one way. And I think working with the locals is also important to figure out what local ground issues are and this could change contextually because otherwise it's these random people coming in saying oh poaching is bad figure out other things to do but if you have 
like I'm guessing these people live on the hinterlands of like cities or things yeah. like that. So they don't have other options. So it's very easy to be like this privileged person from the city going in and being like, you guys need to do better. We will educate you about how harming animals is bad without taking any concrete policy steps to help these people. Right. And what's interesting is that these people are experts in tracking these animals. So one thing that uh, conservationists have been doing with them is getting them involved in uh, ecotourism. Hmm. So, because they're so good at finding the animal, now the difference is that you're taking people around to look at the live animal instead of finding the animal to kill it. So, that is working in many countries and that is working for many species as well. But I think that could be explored more. Yeah, I think so. But just as an aside, uh, I was reading a lot about how like tourism, safaris, conservation mm-hmm. parks are also harming the environment because of the sheer number of people right. who come into these areas. Do you think that's also a problem these days? Yes, I think if that can be regulated and we control the amount of vehicles entering and mm-hmm. we don't encroach on the animal's personal space, then it's good because in a way that it's bringing in money to the local communities as well. But for instance, in Nepal, when Red Panda Network takes eco-tourists into the habitat, they have a policy of not taking more than four to five people at a time because that disturbs the habitat. Mm. So that's uh, that's one thing that you could do. And other ways are just restricting the number of vehicles entering, mm. making sure that the tourists obey the laws. You're not feeding the animals. You're not getting into their space. But you're right. Excess tourism also can be harmful to the animals. I agree with your point. But here's something that I read about recently. Mm. Um, I read that the number of tigers in the world has gone up 33%. Or in the world or in India? In the world. Okay. Um, has gone up 33%. Uh, and that's a great thing, right? Because like I know a lot of people have done campaigns and you see this mm. everywhere that the tiger is a national animal. It's getting extinct. So shouldn't we be celebrating stuff like mm. this? No, you're right. But... We can celebrate an increase in tiger numbers. We definitely should. It's a good thing. But now we should also focus on the habitats and making sure that we're protecting the habitats as well. Because at the rate at which we're developing, we're cutting down forests and we're shrinking their habitats and not making enough corridors for them. So that could lead to a problem. So it's a cause for celebration, but you can't just celebrate. You're saying there's still a lot more work to be done because threats will always come up uh, for these animals. Threats will increase because uh, certain national parks will increase and have already started uh, exceeding their carrying capacity, which is that they have more tigers than what the national park can hold. So tigers are moving on to these buffer zones where there's human habitation. Okay. So yeah. and that is scary because yeah. Yeah. also then where do you go for a space to start like new nature parks and things like that? Mm-hmm. I don't know how you can even mitigate things like carrying capacity. But there are also other animals that face a lot of threats from poaching, um, from humans and for their livelihood and so on. Right? I think you were talking about elephants at some point. Yeah. So I think uh, this was in the news recently that. UK has just banned trade of ivory and rhino horns. Okay. But I remember in 2016, it was still legal. Mm. And it shocked me because people tend to blame uh, the East for everything. In a country like UK, it was still legal. So I remember standing outside Westminster in London and protesting with thousands of others that, Theresa May, please make a big ivory trade illegal so i'm glad that now they've taken a step and it's been banned now and it's a complete ban on ivory trade barring a few exceptions like there are dates where if that ivory existed before like that date then then it's mm-hmm. still fine or like a 10 percent product made up, uh, with less than 10 percent ivory is fine but Overall, it's like a complete ban and it'll start coming into effect later in 2019. Okay, here's a question for you. I'm generally against bans of any kind. I think I told you this like on a personal conversation that whether it's like drugs or alcohol or prostitution, uh, what generally happens with this is that it drives it underground and then you have something called victimless crimes, which Mm -hmm. is people who 
are not really doing anything wrong suddenly become victims like um prostitution for example you have prostitutes who are already vulnerable and by banning prostitution they only become even more vulnerable they're not going to stop doing this um and that's true with drugs with alcohol with anything mm-hmm. uh, how do you think the same logic can be extended to um like trade of animal products in that sense that's very interesting because you're right in a way it does fuel the black market and the prices go up in the black market when it's banned so it it cannot be legalized all over the world so some mm. areas have a legal trade and in some areas it's banned so what happens is then there's no way to regulate what is coming from a legal source and where the animals actually mm. suffering so i think in this case a ban is what we need because we've hunted down these animals to such an extent that their species are facing a threat so till they can recover i think a ban is the best way to go about it yeah i mean i think with things like drugs or alcohol i'm fine with like legalizing them and the, at least the government makes some taxes off of this stuff yeah uh, and you're putting harm into your own body right you're not endangering someone else with yeah it. true but also like if the government makes money off of marijuana or alcohol then at least it's money that's going into the system that can be used at some point um rather than you know like some random dealer getting it uh, it's funny you say that that government is uh, it's okay if the government makes money because with the rhino horns and the ivory some countries in africa they're actually keeping a stockpile of whatever they're cutting down or whatever they catch mm-hmm. in like on raids and stuff on raids yeah whatever they catch in raids and they are waiting that if in the future this trade it gets legalized then this is like a bank of money for them it's obviously it's worth way more than gold so it's literally like a bank of ivory that they're saving now that's very controversial and there are debates going on around the world that okay if you really don't think that an animal product is a commodity and if you think it's worth nothing then just burn it that's what happened in Kenya when they burned oh they burned the- yeah they had like the biggest ivory burn that the world has ever seen as a statement that these hold no value to us but a lot of countries are still keeping these as sort of they say that they're going to use it for conservation if it ever gets legalized but i'm not sure i agree with that Yeah and that was my question right so suppose you're dehorning a rhino mm. then who gets to keep that bit so right now they keep it in a secret vault somewhere and like a bank and they said that they're going to use it for conservation if it ever gets um, legalized so the people who own the game reserve it's for them it's for the communities it's for getting the money back into rhino conservation but i know it sounds like they need it but I, i'm still not sure i agree with it because in at the end of the day you're uh, making profit off of the animals whether it's a government or whether it's people it's yeah. still profiting off animals right i mean i get that it'll help the locals so i think it's a controversy in a much larger debate it is and it also it depends on the government how much is the government keep for itself how much is it actually putting back into these communities yeah, and how and do you regulate sure. the black markets and how do you see where the money goes because i read that a lot of terrorism is funded through poaching as well like, yeah. yeah so the thing with black markets is that all these channels cross we generally say that with drugs with arms running with poaching with prostitution with all kinds of trafficking all of these channels overlap often mm. um so i can see how money from poaching would go into terrorism yeah. i can see how drug money would go into poaching and so on so um tackling it is a huge beast <laughs> by yeah, itself yeah no sorry for the bad pun but um, <laughs> but i think like efforts that you know you are sort of involved with with conservation also have an important role to play because i don't even think people know at least with things like spitting or i don't know social norms mm-hmm. uh people know it's bad at some point it was drilled into them in a civics lesson mm-hmm. uh but with things like conservation i'm, I'm not even sure that education is adequate no it doesn't and for instance i did this instagram story for example i'll Uh, social media can come very handy in spreading awareness that way because i did this instagram story with blue planet live and within 24 hours we were able to reach about a million people and 
that's really powerful because we sort of plug in conservation everywhere. So I was telling the story of baby turtles, but I was also plugging in that every time you go to an ocean, yeah. every time you go to the beach, you make sure you don't pollute the beach because this is going back to the turtles. This is responsible for killing the turtles. So you just be more conscious about it. Also urging them to go to this village and promote ecotourism there so that the money comes back to these people because a lot of them used to consume turtle eggs as children. Mm. They thought it was a high source of protein, but now they've been sensitized and they're working in turtle conservation and they hold a turtle festival every year. This sounds awesome. Where is this? This is in Maharashtra by the coast of Velas mm. and every year they have a turtle festival festival where they celebrate the hatching of baby olive ridley turtles and it's beautiful to watch how hard they're working to protect these eggs and they create artificial hatcheries and they release the turtles once they're born and you know sort of give them a fighting chance so yeah i think for all the mindless celebrations that we have in this country <laughs> this at least sounds like a great effort you're doing something that's social as well yeah. as you're making the conservation of nature, an intimate exactly. part of your life. And when people like us visit these festivals and it encourages them that, okay, money, because obviously monetarily, if they're doing well, then they can continue doing it. Mm -hmm. So this encourages them that they're doing something good for the environment and they're making money as well. Then that's very important. So I think to send people like us there, social media is very useful. Yeah, that sounds very powerful. I didn't realize you could do that through Instagram. Mm. Um, what are other projects that you're currently working on? So I just uh, released a documentary on King Cobras. Okay. And I directed and edited this uh, with a production house called Gaia People. Mm. And it's going to be dubbed in local languages now. It's being dubbed in Telugu already. The, the Telugu version will release, but also Uriya and Northeastern languages. But the point is that it's about the conflict people have with king cobras. So king cobras are the longest venomous snakes mm. in the world, but they have hardly bitten a human. Oh. But 50,000 people in India die of snake bites every year. And that's due to other venomous snakes. And king cobras eat these venomous snakes. So what people don't realize is that they're actually helping them. But king cobras get killed at sight in these conflict areas because people are so afraid of snakes. And just because there's this huge snake in front of them, they kill it. And that's really sad for a very for such a beautiful species. So we made a film about this village in Karnataka called Agombe, mm -hmm. where people coexist with king cobras. And using that as a model, and we're trying to show how gentle this creature is. It's the only snake in the world that makes a nest for its young. And just the general quirks about the behavior to sort of make them fall in love with the species so they can realize that it is possible to live with the snake. And if they actually don't go and harm the snake, the snake would let them be, it won't come in their way, it won't unnecessarily bite them. So this is very important for the conflict zones across India and even in Thailand so that um, people don't kill these snakes anymore. So that's something that I just released. Uh, just a question because you'd mentioned this. Are there conservation efforts that are happening in local languages because you deal with like conservation films, right? Is the government or are there people who make these films in local languages so that people living everywhere can understand because English is the language of the elite at the end of the day, right? Right, right. So that's what we try to do. We release the English version online, but we also dub it in local languages because the real conflict exists at the local level and NGOs at the grassroots, they hold public screenings and they try to sensitize the people in their local languages because you're right, it just releasing something in English, like a blue chip BBC documentary would never reach a person living in a remote village. But that's something that we're sort of trying to bridge. Okay. What else are you working on? I'm working on a documentary on pangolin trade. So pangolins are the world's most trafficked animals. Okay. And we hardly see them in the wild. Uh, but when there are raids, there are thousands and thousands of scales that are caught. So there is definitely something fishy going on around there. So it's a documentary about that. And I'm also, I joined hands with Extinction Rebellion. Okay. Who and are the Extinction Rebellion? 
we are non violent people who like to hold protests to hold the government accountable basically everything that we talked about um it's an emergency definitely an emergency but our governments across the world they don't realize that we need to act now we need to stop burning fuels we need to stop and there are solutions for everything it's just that the governments think that especially with our country we want to develop but we're not developing sustainably so this is sort of like to urge the governments to act now that makes sense i know we've spoken about like a lot of things that are powerful um that really sort of make you wonder about the life that you're living but what gives you hope in this space <laughs> i think that's a very good question because we definitely need to have hope otherwise we'd all be really depressed souls because climate depression is a real thing it can, really climate depression yeah it can affect you because you've been thinking about the doomsday and no but there is hope and we've been given the next 12 years to reverse all the effects and if we stop doing what we're doing and actually work towards solving the crisis then we can reverse the effects of climate change it's like a bottleneck if we pass these 12 years and we could be fine so there's one hope there and i also see a lot of youngsters um coming up and realizing this issue and taking it up like greta thunberg started this in sweden and the movements gone across the world now children are coming up and holding adults accountable they're saying that this is not the future we asked for why did you give birth to us if you wanted to give us this world so children are uh, stepping up so th- that's like a ray of hope and with conservation efforts at the grassroots local communities are getting involved there are a lot of uh, community forests and people want to protect their animals there's this sense of belonging that they have so yeah of course there's hope and with all my stories also i try and end on a positive note like i show how people are fighting for species and how there's a hope in every story there's like a silver lining and because we always need that hope to hold on to and work towards it because otherwise what's the point i agree okay so this is my last question that i ask all my guests i would because a lot of them are academics i would ask them what books they would recommend for people who want to know more about conservation but what are any other resources movies books uh, websites anything for people who want to know more about conservation who want to know more about conservation filmmaking what would you suggest sure so there's um, i like to recommend this one film that really made a big impact on me it's called virunga it's on netflix okay it's about the oil crisis in virunga and how uh, locals were saving gorillas within that time and how the corporates were like the war it's about everything it's beautiful i think i'll spoil it if i talk more about it but right. definitely watch virunga and racing extinction is a good one it's about like how we're all racing towards extinction and how some people are trying to fight it and it really shows you a true picture of what is happening around the world there's a book called this is not a drill that extinction rebellion just released that's a really good one that shows you exactly what's happening and what the movement is about if anyone's free to join so because civil disobedience started here that's the core of the value mm. and that started in india and it's a very powerful way to actually get heard mm. and the other film that you should try and get a hold of was uh, shows of silence which i spoke about earlier it's a very simple film but it changed things at the policy level so that's something that's going to be very powerful to watch So as i said the planet is undergoing the sixth mass extinction the sixth time in the history of life on earth that global fauna has experienced a major collapse in numbers and historically mass extinctions have been caused by catastrophic events like asteroid collisions but this time human activities are to blame and the primary culprits are deforestation mining carbon dioxide emissions that cause the planet to heat up and as a result insects are dying off at record rates animals are experiencing biological annihilation and invasive aliens are driving native species to extinction thank you gunjan thank you for the work that you're doing and best of luck with everything you do thank you so happy to be here thank you for having me 
That's it for this episode of States of Anarchy. If you want to delve deeper into some of the topics that we discuss on the podcast, whether it's public policy or foreign policy, I suggest you check out some of the policy courses at the Takshashila Institution. They're of varying lengths, so you can choose depending on your interest, and you can attend the classes from home. So do check those out. If you have any comments or questions, you can reach out to me at Hamsni H on Twitter and at States of Anarchy on Instagram. You can listen to States of Anarchy not only on the IBM podcast app and website, but wherever it is that you get your podcasts. We'll be back next Tuesday. Hi, I'm Sariyu Natarajan, and I'm Alok Prasanna Kumar, and we are the hosts of the Ganatantra podcast. On this podcast, we speak to academics, social scientists, journalists, and activists to find out what's actually going on in Indian politics. On this podcast, we stay away from personality politics, intrigue, and gossip, and instead focus on the data, research, and analysis that drives all this. So tune in to the Ganatantra podcast, where new episodes are out every Wednesday on the IVM podcast app, website, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. The modern world is obsessed with food and agriculture. Everywhere you look, new and exciting technologies are bringing food innovation to your street market, your grocery store, your doorstep, and your plate. From our quest for the perfect food photos to our rediscovery of ancient grains, quite simply, food has never been sexier. But guess what? The modern food system is broken. It's a major cause of climate change. antibiotic resistance and global poverty so how did we get here and where are we going most importantly how are we going to feed 10 billion people globally by the year 2050 through better more sustainable means i'm varun deshpande and i'm ramya ramurthy and we work for the good food institute a global non-profit accelerating the transformation to a more healthy sustainable and just food system The next food revolution is here. On Feeding 10 Billion, we're giving you the inside view. You can tune into us every Tuesday on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs>